Good afternoon, attendees. My name is Stephanie Barry Collier. I am the Fort Bend County Courts Administrator in Richmond, Texas. And I'm your host today for this NACAM workshop entitled Blueprint for Racial Justice. So I'll repeat that. It's Blueprint for Racial Justice to make sure you are where you want to be and need to be this afternoon. This presentation is being live streamed and we welcome those attendees as well. One reminder, please, at the conclusion of the workshop, please make sure you complete the evaluation, okay? And you can find all of the information you need on your app. This afternoon, we have the opportunity to participate in productive dialogue and thoughtful discussion regarding issues that affect our criminal justice system. Director Bell has over 24 years of justice system experience and is an Institute for Court Management Fellow, which I understand that's a very big deal. That means you have knowledge to share. When asked to share a little known fact about him, this is a direct quote. He said, I have personally visited all 159, 159 counties in my home state of Georgia for official business purposes. That's a feat and that's something that's worth noting. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the Director of Race, Justice, Equity, and Inclusion at the National Center for State Courts, Mr. Edwin Bell. Thank you. Okay, so let me start off by saying this is an informational session. It's softball, so if you came in here looking for some, some Atlanta Brave hard hitting, uh, fastball pitches. This is not necessarily that. It's information because I want to share with you some of the work that's been going on for a while that you may or may not be aware of. In a, in a nutshell, we call it the blueprint for racial justice. So if you were an architect or an engineer, there is absolutely no way you would build a house or a building without a set of organized plans that we call blueprints. You just wouldn't do it. It doesn't make sense to get out there, begin to build. You don't know what it's going to cost. You don't have an idea as to how much time it's going to take to get done. So you develop blueprints. So we came up with this moniker about a year and three months or so ago that we're calling this the blueprint. So we'll get into a little bit more about that in a minute. So again, don't worry about what you see on the screen. Pay attention to me, and if you have questions, I'll answer them as we go along. I'm not trying to make you wait to the end and then forget what you wanted to ask. So that's me, Edwin Bell, Director of Racial Justice, Equity, and Inclusion for the National Center for State Courts. Prior to this, I was in DeKalb County, Georgia. Oh, see, you hear the whistles. As a Deputy Administrator in our Superior Court, and in some court, states you call that your circuit court. Temperature check. Now, this is something I do all the time. Because I have to gauge who's in the room and how you feel about a few things. So, by show of hands, if you are a full-time judge, please raise your hand. Okay. If you are elected, please raise your hand. If you work in a rural setting in your community, please raise your hand. Okay? No. If you're in a suburban setting, please raise your hand. And if you are in an urban setting, please raise your hand. So I do that to have an understanding for about who's, who's here. But no matter what, the information I'm providing applies to everybody, no matter where you are. Now the circumstances may be a little bit different and how you apply some things may be a little bit different based upon where you live or where you work, right? I am a realist. I'm not gonna send you uh, back with some information and expect you to apply it the same way irrespective of your local community because that is foolish and does not make any sense. 
Not one of those people to rah, rah and chant from the rafters and expect you to go back and do something that will get you ran out of town. If you're elected, get you kicked out of your seat. And if you're not elected and you're appointed to get the people that you work for to reconsider your employment, <laughs> not going to do that. This little thing here, please take a read if you can. But it's a, a little quote by an author named Mark Twain. I don't know about heart, so I'm going to read it to you. 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than those things you did. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from safe harbor, catch wind in your sails, explore, dream, and discover. And I put that there for a couple of key reasons. One is of which is the part about safe harbor. So many people go to work every day, whether you're elected or appointed, taking the safe route because you are overly concerned with maintaining your individual status quo. That's the reality. If I'm elected, nothing against my elected officials, but more than likely, if you're elected, you want to be reelected. And so you operate in a fashion that you personally believe is consistent with the beliefs of the community in which you serve. If you are appointed, you often operate in a manner in which you believe is consistent with the thoughts, opinions, ideas, and beliefs of the people who appointed you. Self-preservation. I'm not knocking you, not talking bad about you, but it is a reality that I have observed over the years, and if you're honest with yourselves, for the most part, you, you know I'm telling the truth. I'm not gonna sit here and say, who cares about your, your, your salary and your mortgage? Just jump head first into this stuff, and if you lose your job, no, psh, whatever, because that's not the reality, right? Most people aren't going to do that. They're gonna take a measured approach to getting things done and if it means you ease off the accelerator, you ease off the accelerator. And I'm okay with that. Uh oh. I'm like, changing judicial societal norms. I put that there because we operate in judicial society. There's a set of decorum, there's traditions that are father, followed by us by our elected officials and have been this way for millennia. You don't up in the apple cart because you get these wild ideas and want to change the world. We all operate within a construct, a system that has been well established long before any person in this room within the sound of my voice or streaming on video has been around. But you'll see here, July 2020, what was going on in 2020? A <laughs> lot of civil unrest, not so civil sometimes. Why? People ticked off. Impetus one, George Floyd killed by people who took an oath to protect and serve. Now. What I get from judges is, we aren't the police. We didn't kill anybody. We just take the cases that show up at the courthouse. True. But when you're a lion of judicial society, which is who our elected officials are, they're not cats, they're lions. You can impact that. So in July 2020, the Joint Conference of Chief Justices and Conference of State Court Administrators issued a resolution, Resolution 1. And part of that is there. To examine what systemic change is needed to make equality under the law an enduring reality for all, so that justice is not only fair to all, but also is recognized by all to be fair. There's a difference. It's easy to say that you're fair. If everybody was as fair as they claim, we wouldn't have some of the mess we have going on now. 
That's why that's there. And if you don't know what those two conferences are, let me tell you, because it's important. Every state has a chief justice or chief judge, like Maryland and New York, to call that person the chief judge. Every state, to some degree, has an administrative office of the court's director or state court administrator. So we have all these laws, but we have policy and ideas that are often pushed down by these two organizations. Sometimes if you're working in a court system and you're doing things, you don't even know why you're doing it. That's because people at the highest levels have made some decisions and pushed it down over time. Next thing you know, you're in your local state's conference and you're hearing stuff and then you start doing it as best practice, but it originated here. Leaders leading the lines of judicial society, and I won't name them all, but this is a group of people that I report to, in addition to my, my boss, Mary McQueen, at the National Center. Come from different states, have different perspectives, different backgrounds. And just so you know, the people whose name don't have chief by it, those are your state court administrators. And this is strategically done. We select people from different geographical areas, have different ideological bends, because if you only work within an echo chamber with people who agree with everything you say, you will not get anything done. You have to have people who operate in our system who may have different per opinions and perspectives, sometimes based on their geographic location. I come from Georgia, right? You have Atlanta, but you have Georgia. There is a difference. So when she gave my little known fact about me having worked and, and done something on official business in all 159 of our counties, I can tell you right now from many years of experience, there's a heck of a difference between Atlanta and middle Georgia and South Georgia and North Georgia. I tell people all the time, if you start in Atlanta with Interstate I-20, north and uh, east and west, Interstates 75 and 85 north and west on a Sunday morning, drive 65 miles per hour in 30 minutes, you have left Atlanta, you are in Georgia. And the reality is Georgia runs Georgia. Atlanta doesn't run Georgia. Okay? But these are the people whose collective minds have come together to help guide the effort. They're part of my steering committee. Partner organizations can't do this by ourselves. Essentially, if you if you could read all of this, it's the who's who of the people that in some way, shape or form have shaped American jurisprudence. These organizations, you think in your state you hot stuff. There are other people who are hotter than you, whether you're elected or not. People are making decisions that impact how you do business. And if you don't know, now you know. One of the reasons why I'm here, because I was concerned that while our chief justices and state court administrators know this stuff, that as you drop down to the trial and local court level, that you all don't know this stuff is even going on. You need to know. There are people operating, working in best interests that you may have never heard of, but you should know. Navigating change. So the blueprint for racial justice has four primary working groups and they're listed there. And I might get them out of order, but it's fairness and awareness, systemic change, increasing diversity of the bench, bar, and workforce, and communications and implementation. They all have different purposes of what they're supposed to be doing, but it is a collective effort of over 150 people from across the country that are involved in this effort. The people who were selected were nominated by their state court administrator and or the chief judge or chief justice of their respective state. In addition to those nominations, the partner organizations that I listed earlier 
additionally nominated or recommended people to serve as members collectively of the overall blueprint for racial justice. That's a lot of people. And as all of you in this room probably know, the more people involved, the more difficult sometimes it is to get things done. But I talked about that echo chamber, unlike the noise that I'm hearing now. If you don't have all of these people involved, people who are extremely important for the positions they hold within an organization and within their home states, my experience is that they'll turn off and that's not what I want. I need people who disagree with me and my perspective to have a seat at the table and be willing to discuss some things. Because if you don't have that, we all know that the majority of people who are in charge and who are in power, if they decide to turn off and shut you out, then this is all for naught. It's wasted effort. So we've got these, issues, these, these areas here. So fairness and awareness. We've got a few different areas that that particular work group has been working on for over a year now. And you'll see some of the, the titles in the block if you can read them. And again, if not, I can get you all this, this presentation, but it should be in the, in the app. But there are certain things that this work group has been working on with various people and subgroups and subcommittees um, that we hope what comes out of it is ultimately institutionalized in America's state court systems. Now, when I say state court, I'm talking about non-federal courts. Non-federal courts. When we use the term state court, we're talking about the courts that are not federal. So one of the highlights of this, and I won't go into deep detail, but the Fairness and Awareness work group is working on a shared language guide. So the shared language guide is sort of like a, a dictionary, thesaurus, mixed together. Because depending on who you talk to and where they are from, you'll use words that might mean one thing to you and mean something totally different to someone else, such as equity. The term equity has been highly charged and in my opinion has been hijacked by some people to make it seem like it's something negative. But as I've said to judges, most of you know what equity is, whether it's an equitable share or distribution or something, if you're in a family case or domestic case or a business case, and you have business people having disputes on money, that's equity. So the word equity shouldn't be as highly charged, but it's become that way. And sometimes we know it, some of this stuff is highly politicized. But I'll tell you, our efforts with the Blueprint for Racial Justice center on what the judicial branch itself can control. We've been criticized by people who want us to, to go after each state legislature and forcefully get these laws changed. That's not our lane. Everyone has a role to play. That's not our role. Our role is to function and operate in the judicial branch lane for those things that are exclusively under the authority of the judiciary. But shared language guide, when it comes out, take a read. Some of the contents will surprise you. The other thing coming out of this group, we call it the OAT, the Organizational Assessment Tool. It is the number one requested item of me since I began employment with the National Center in October of 2020. People want a tool, something to help them with their court figure out what to do. So what is the OAT? It gathers information, that's the court's inputs, putting information in. Obviously there's some data elements to that. You, this tool will, and I'm not a mathematician or a data scientist, so please forgive me. The tool, there'll be an algorithm as I'm told, it'll analyze the data and then it'll be your compass. That's when you move forward with the information. 
But when the organizational assessment tool comes out, if you're familiar with the suite of tools that the National Center for State Courts has on their website, like Court Tools and some others, this will accompany those other suites of tools. This, is, this will serve as a jurisdiction's compass to help them figure out their way and figure out in which direction they need to move in. Because often what happens when you're trying to assess yourself and figure out what to do, you go with your gut. What's the problem with going with your gut? You might be off course. So it's better to take an analytical approach or an empirical approach to how you decide to move and what things you decide to address within your respective court system. Systemic change. Systemic change uh, is the work group that addresses those things that are systemic, otherwise institutionalized, or simply put, baked in. This is how business is done. It does not matter if a new judge retires, another judge takes the bench, a new court administrator retires, I mean, old court administrator retires, new court administrator takes over. The way you operate is baked in. It is systemic. So unless you take a, uh, a, a nuanced approach to unraveling some things, nothing will change. And it does not matter who occupies a position of power. It's systemic. You'll see here we have a number of things and I'll just blurt them out. Plea bargaining, no knock warrants. Um, bail reform, sentencing, fines and fees, other evidence-based stuff, driver's license suspension. You know, you're late on your, or you haven't paid your child support. So now you lose your license. You can't go to work. You really can't pay child support now. So these are the systemic, uh, just a few of the systemic items that are being addressed by that group. A couple of things have come out already, but real quick, webinars rule the world. I don't know if, if many of you know, we have produced so many webinars that if you haven't been able to keep up with the information that's been coming out of the Blueprint for Racial Justice, you go to the National Center for State Courts webpage, search it, and um, we've probably got a whole laundry list of webinars from things that have already occurred. Pre-trial supervision, jury matters, all that stuff. Now, this has come out recently. Um, I don't know that it's yet been, it has not yet been published but I put it here anyway, in short form. I believe there are seven guiding principles that the systemic change uh, work group has come up with. And you'll see them there. As it says, systemic change should be truly systemic, right? Which means if you're making a change, it needs to be baked in just like the change you're trying to change. Systemic change should be transparent, which means as you're developing these changes, you've allowed others to see, understand, and participate in those changes. So no one can say, oh, you came up with this stuff cloaked in darkness. You didn't give me or my jurisdiction an opportunity to, to provide commentary and to be involved. Now, I already mentioned there's over 150 people involved. I can't put 150,000, I'm sorry. <laughs> but but that's that with being transparent. Systemic change should be intentional, purposeful, and dynamic, intentional, you meant to do it, purposeful. It actually serves a purpose. You're not just doing window dressing. And dynamic, there's some movement happening. Should be sustainable, which means we don't want to do change for change sake. And then somebody else comes in who's in charge and then changes it. Because therefore, it's not baked in. Right. If it is truly systemic, it's baked into our processes and in our court or judicial way of life. It should be stakeholder and community inclusive stakeholders. We're all stakeholders. Other people who come in and utilize our respective court systems are our stakeholders. Community inclusive means you need to be thinking about how the decisions you make impact the people in the community. Far too often, we make decisions that are most efficient, that we believe are most efficient and best for us. We don't make decisions that are best for the community. You want a hundred people on that calendar on Monday morning. 
<laughs> is that best for the community? Because no, if I'm number one, uh, if I'm number 99, am I going to be on the calendar at 9 a.m.? Is the judge going to hear my case? No. If I got a lawyer, maybe preferential treatment. But judges will say, oh, that's efficient. You have to think about that. So it means you're trying to do something wrong, but it's a way you, business has been done. You have to retrain your brain for what makes sense, not just for us, but for the communities in which we serve. Our elected people understand that. But sometimes, sometimes, even they become a little more concerned with their schedules. And I'm not bashing them because I, I have a great deal of respect for people who are willing to put their neck out there on a ballot somewhere. <laughs> but it's the reality that we all work in. Systemic change should be tailored to the community, right? Tailored to the community. It's like a good tailored suit. You're not going to come up with ideas and, and, and operational adjustments just because you think it, it sounds good. You're going to look at what's going on in your local community and then based on what's going on in the dynamics of your community, apply some of these newer practices to your community. You're right sizing them. You're tailoring them to what works for your community. What's going to work in Atlanta may not work in Cairo. What works in Los Angeles may or may not work in Oakland. Tailor it. And last, systemic change should be informed by data and ultimately evaluated. And we use the word informed, not driven. Because if anyone who knows data, and there are some of you in here who I know, know data very well, data can be a tricky thing depending on how it's applied. Some things are statistically significant. Others are statistically insignificant. And the last thing you want to do is make an adjustment to court policy and procedure based on a statistically insignificant data point. Right. So we say data informed, which means you have the data, you've seen it, you've thought about it and you apply it to your local concern. So we'll jump out of here. This work group here. Increasing diversity of the bench bar and court workforce. Now, I will tell you initially court workforce was not on here. You know why? You're so quiet. Because most of the time when we think when people in the judiciary talk about diversity, right, they always talk about lawyers and judges. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer. I have love for lawyers and judges. But the reality is the vast majority of people who work in, in America's courthouses are not judges and lawyers. So if your only focus is on increasing diversity of the bench and the bar, you probably leave an 80 percent of your courthouse workforce unaccounted for. And I will tell you from my experience, most judges hadn't even thought about that. Because the, it's about their lawyers think about lawyers. Majority of people work in courthouses are not lawyers. The majority of people who the community and people who have court matters that enter America's courthouses never see a judge. Never see a judge. Right. Allow me. Maybe some of y'all have courthouses where everybody sees a judge every day. That's but most courthouses I'm familiar with. People don't see a judge most of the time. Very few. Very few court matters are handled in front of a judge. So there are a number of different things that this work group has been involved in. And one I'll point out at the top bullet point, the strategic planning guide out of Delaware. The chief justice of the, of the state of Delaware and their bar wanted to figure out how to increase the number 
of, of diverse lawyers in their state. Delaware has a, a system where you cannot, um, if you're a lawyer, what do you call it when you can practice in another state? Reciprocity? They don't have reciprocity. So if you want to practice law in Delaware, you have to take the Delaware bar. Well, you know, Delaware is small. It's like from here to across the street, right? Um, probably the majority of the big business in this country are registered in Delaware. Very lucrative business practices in Delaware. The Chancery Court, even though you have the Supreme Court, but that Chancery Court is where the money resides. And so they wanted to figure out what could they do. And we partnered with an organization called Access Lex to look at what are the barriers in that state and what things can be done to increase um, uh, black, brown and other minorities, if you want to call them minorities, um, in that pipeline for the legal profession. But then there's other things that I talk about, ways to increase diversity on the bench. Quasi-judicial appointments. I can't speak for all states, but in some states, there are a lot of people who wear black robes whose name never appeared on a ballot, and they were never appointed by a governor, and they were never appointed by a judicial commission or their state house and senate, some joint thing. They were, there's an order signed, some local lawyer, and you get up there and everybody in that courtroom calls you judge, but you're really a quasi judge. It's not your full. That's why one of the reasons why I asked how many full time judges do we have? Because these other people are not. But everybody who walks in that courtroom and sees a black robe calls them judge. That is an easy way in states that legally allow those persons to serve as judges, an easy way to increase the diversity on the bench, at least temporarily. Because in my experience, if someone never has opportunity, they never get the real job. They never run for the job. It seems so far out of touch and out of reach for them. So we talk about these quasi-judicial appointments. And they got all kind of different names. And you know, I didn't, I'm sure I didn't capture them all, but in your state, you may have some names for these people. Hopefully you all understand what I'm talking about. Then you'll see the other bullets, National Intern Project, National Extern Program for Law Clerks, Pipeline Project Recruitment Efforts. We've got, I'll capture all those here. The federal system uses a program called OSCAR. So if you ever wanted to be a federal court clerk, you apply, I don't care where you live, through a system called OSCAR. So one day I was like, hmm, can we create a state level Oscar? So that committee with some probably subcommittees began doing some research, found a company, said, yeah, we have a system that can pretty much do what the Oscar system does, but it would be for use by the state courts. The thought being that if you have people from diverse backgrounds all over the country, including the territories, including Alaska, Hawaii, able to say, you know what? I live in Wisconsin, right? But I love to work in Alaska. But generally speaking, uh, the judicial branch in Alaska or whatever, they never hear of you. This system, hopefully we get it working right, which I believe we will, will allow people to put their information in and then courts around the country who have chosen to opt in to utilizing this system will be able to select diverse candidates from anywhere if that candidate has selected that they're willing to work in your state. Because some states, quite honestly, their population of uh, black, brown and other uh, generally considered minority groups may just be very small. Right. They just may be very small. It doesn't doesn't mean there's anything nefarious going on, but some places just too cold. <laughs> so, you know, you'll visit, but you may not stay. But scales, it's not out yet, but it's coming. We just had our demonstration on Friday. OK. And it's not only for lawyers, it's for non-lawyers. 
Communication and implementation. Key work group. Whole bunch of stuff there. I'm not going to point out anybody in particular to talk about this. But there are a lot of different things that this group has been working on for a while. Because if you don't have an effective communications plan, then people won't know what you're doing, even if you're the most well-meaning person or group on the planet. You've got to effectively communicate what you're doing. A couple of things I want to point out. Communication plan and hotline. I think that's ambitious. It's going to happen. Not all court systems have PIOs, directors of communication and online media, or whatever the, the title is. Most court systems don't have that. Our hope is that through existing relationships that we already have, such as CCPIO, Conference of Court Public Information Officers and others, that we can develop a hotline where if your court is in crisis, especially with stuff related to racial matters, diversity, equity, and inclusion matters, you can call the pipeline and get some assistance. Oftentimes, courts either are zip tight and quiet. I understand, hopefully, that news cycle passes you by. I get it. I've been a part of that plenty of times. Sometimes it won't, depending on what the situation is. And you need some help. So hopefully we get that up and going. State DEI commissions. Michigan just author well authorized back in January, but just recently within the past two weeks appointed members of their new commission uh, on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the judiciary. Part of this, or, uh, this work group's responsibility is to help work with any commission that needs help, some understanding, some guidance to some degree. So people aren't fledgling because what happens, we talk about that gut instinct. There are many judicial systems that are trying to develop and do things, but they don't know how. And there are a lot of highly intelligent people that work within our, uh, our state court systems, but it doesn't mean that they're an expert in everything. Okay. DEI officers group will be producing, or excuse me, not producing, putting together a listserv. So any other listserv that you can imagine, this listserv will be for people whose primary function is the DEI space for courts, where they can have an open sharing and discussion of ideas and dialogue amongst each other. But you come down from communication implementation resource center, where we have a resource center that has been established for racial justice. It is on the National Center's website. It's online, all kinds of stuff there, and it's steadily growing. So if you go to it today, please don't crash the website. But if you go to it and you see, well, I already know about that, I already know about that, that's fine. But it's going to grow because that's the number two thing I was at. Number one was that a tool, number two was a resource center. Because depending on where you work, you may not readily, uh, it may have readily available certain pieces of information that could be beneficial to your court. No need in recreating the wheel if you can go to a resource center and see that another state or jurisdiction within a state court system has already done it. Maybe you can take it, retool it a bit, and make it applicable to your local community. And then we talk about webinars, newsletters, other uh, communication efforts, a speakers bureau, which we need because I talk a lot and I need other people. People who can talk and speak intelligently and productively on these matters. I'm not looking for firebrands. We're looking for people who truly love the judiciary and who want to have productive dialogue and help our courts make necessary changes and adjustments so they can better serve the communities that they operate in. And then technical assistance. I don't know what that is yet. Otherwise, if you need help, Send me an email and we'll figure it out. So let me jump to something. Watch, read, and listen. Watch, read, and listen is an initiative of the communication and implementation work group. Now, let's put those three words. That's why I told you don't focus on the screen. But it's to 
we, that group has been working to um, promote educational opportunities in those formats. It might be movies, it might be podcasts, there might be books. There's a, I think the current one is a book, and I can't think of the name, The Sweetness of Water. And these, things, these, these um, mediums are selected based upon discussion amongst the work group members and the content or context of whatever that medium is. Because, you know, we think that if you review some things, you watch some things, you understand some things that maybe you wouldn't otherwise, it has like, it's, it's just like data. It helps to inform your thought processes. Now, this is the big one. November of this year, we'll be convening, uh, will be a national convening of court DEI professionals in Atlanta. Now, I know there are very few people whose full-time job is to serve as a DEI officer in their respective court system, either at the state level or the local level. But we're going to pull all these people together, including those who that may not be their primary function, but that they were recommended because it's by invitation only. But they'll be. But if you recommend somebody, I'll look at it. We're going to convene these people so we can have some dialogue over two days. What are the challenges? If you occupy that kind of position, what problems are you running into? It's just you. Why? Sometimes it's one person trying to save the world. I tell people all the time, don't try to save the world. Right. Another challenge for DEI officers in a court setting. Most of them did not come from the courts. They had other professional backgrounds. Collegiate backgrounds, academia. They worked in corporate America. They come into the judicial branch having no clue that, yeah, you may have a chief judge or even a chief justice, but that's a chief among equals. Except for where statute or what have you allows the chief to make a certain final decisions and all of that. So a lot of people who are DEI professionals, they decide they see these new job right now. There's a job posted in Indiana. Anybody interested? Check it out. But they see these positions, they have this experience, they carry these certifications in DEI, and then they come and work in the course and they wash out. Because they didn't understand when they came to work for the court that just because the chief judge or the chief justice or the court administrator or the state court administrator said something, that everybody else is not gonna just fall in line. And so we need this convening to gather people around to talk about it because people are burning out and some of these people only hold on their jobs three and six months. So we've got to intervene and this is part of the intervention. So if you know someone in your state who should come, let me know. What's the future hold? I don't know. I really don't know. My hope is that through these collective efforts that our judicial systems around this country will begin to evolve. They'll begin to adjust, change systemically. And that these efforts will become baked in. It will be the new normal. It hurts my heart to see a court system anywhere in crisis. Because I know that the majority of people who work in that building, whatever it is, are doing the best that they can. But we all bring our baggage to work. We bring how we were trained at home, how we were tra trained in our neighborhoods, how we were trained in our faith system, whatever that is, we bring it to the courthouse. 
And then since we collectively bring that, it comes out of us in how ju- uh, uh, cases are presided over, decisions are rendered, how certain matters are enforced or not. And so we have to figure out where are the areas that can be impacted by us that make sense? How can we be productive? And I use that word productive because it doesn't make sense to get a bunch of people in the room and argue and shout. And then everyone retreat to their corners and nothing changes. Right. One other thing I want to say, it's not a black thing. It's not a black issue. Sometimes your diverse is your diversity issue. Is the fact that everybody that works in your building went to the same college, has the same philosophy. If you're a judge and you went to the University of Wisconsin and they have a law school, you only hire law clerks that graduated from that law school who have the same legal philosophy. You don't give a law clerk who went to some other law school an opportunity. So you lack diversity there. We talk about implicit bias. Everybody has it. My second day on the job, I had a judge who's now retired in our jurisdiction called me up during voir dire, right? Talking through all these jurors, wanted me to sit next to him. Thought it was okay, thought it was a bit strange. One thing, he memorized everybody's name. I don't know how he did it, but he talked about bias. He said, you know, we all have biases. Right? It doesn't matter what you look like, right? It doesn't matter. But can you control your biases and be objective? Realize that you actually have them. Because when some people tell me, I don't have a bias, I know they're lying. You're lying. You do. Some people may not realize that they have implicit bias, some people have explicit bias. We used to have a judge in a, in a jurisdiction that shall remain nameless that they called, and I'm not going to say the judge's last name, I'm not going to say if it's a she or he or they. They called, they called that judge, hang him high so-and-so. Hang him high so-and-so. Because in, when certain people would appear before the judge, the judge had already decided that they were going to hand out a certain amount of time. Another judge would make jokes and say, when you get out of jail, oh no, would say, did you see the tree out front before you came in? Oftentimes, the defendant will say, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, by the time you get out, there'll be one there. Bias. And that judge was black. Sometimes people that look like you treat you the worst. It's a bias. It's been developed over time. What does the future hold? My hope is that the future contains all of you who are making meaningful contributions. Madam Clerk. I'm still curious why the judge called you to sit wanted me, what I was told after, at the end of the day, he wanted, to, wanted me to see how much he cared about people and trying to get them to understand that they have to be thinking about their decisions not going off of some benign instinct. That person is guilty. That person doesn't deserve those children. Those children need to be removed from the home. That officer surely didn't do anything wrong because he or she is an officer of the law. One of the things. 
So I hope that you all have questions because I've got answers. Ma'am, I can't keep you mind. Okay, no, no. Hold on. Read that, please. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. What can your court do to change the um, the workforce in for the citizens that come into the court? Because many times citizens come in with their own biases and think that um, when they walk into the courtroom, they're already they're really scared and you know, and they're not getting the the help or the assistance. Once they come to the front, the first thing they see are sheriffs and deputy. And, mm. you know, you might come in there just to get a passport or to get a divorce or to get, you know, divorce mm. paper to file. But you are um, intimidated by okay. the workforce. And so how does your court help? Or can, how can they help? Or I want to get it to the leaders to make some changes in the courtroom, not just in one section, but in the whole section okay so let me say what i think you're yes I, i'll try to paraphrase as best i can i think what she's asking is what can your court do to ally the fears that people have yes. right you see deputies well there's there are some things that we can we, there are some things we can only do so much about right i think what happens is to impact the the community their thoughts, their psyche, uh, their trust in the system is they have to see change, meaningful and measurable change over time. Anybody can have a situation happen and you make some quick changes, it'll only be viewed as window dressing. Over time, in order for the community to trust our systems, they have to see that the outcomes are fair. Remember I pointed out resolution one, equality to all, right? But you want all to recognize our systems as fair. Until that happens, they'll continue to think or believe what they want. And many of us in here will already be retired by the time some of this change occurs or dead. It's an endeavor. This is not a project. It's not an initiative. It is an endeavor. Sustained change over time that the community and members of the community can actually see and believe in. Any other questions? Wow. I'm sorry. Hold on. Just hold on. Just ma'am. Ma okay. We have a streaming audience. If you would please speak into the, the microphone. I appreciate it. Thank you. With all of these groups, Implicit bias. How how are you really going to address, get to the core of it, mm. and where is the resolve? Okay. Great question. All right. So over time, I'm not big into changing the hearts of minds of anybody. I'm big on policy change, procedure change. Because if we are a nation of laws, we operate under the rule of law. As you change those things and you begin to see the residual effects of that change, attitudes will begin to change with it, including your biases. Some biases are entrenched because the system as it is doesn't really allow for the decision makers to see anything different from their perspective. And we all have a different perspective. But that's why you have to have sustainable, measurable and systemic changes worked into our system. Over time. Any other questions? I know you don't, but we have people who are at, who are at work, couldn't be here like you flying all over, spending that good government money. So they, they need to be able to hear you. <laughs> so the, I know we, we talked about, you know, like we're working on what we can change within our lane. Mm -hmm. And that, then that makes complete sense. Right. Sometimes we are blocked by 
Legis legislative issues understood. Cool. Yep. Um, is, is the committee again? I know that we're focused on what we can address, mm -hmm. but will there be any at any time any discussion on? Um, not certainly not. Um, influencing the legislative change isn't necessarily the right word that I want to use, but it's mm -hmm. what I'm going to run with right now. Mm -hmm. um, because I think I think that's something that a lot of us do struggle with is. Yeah. We can only implement what we can implement. Right. So I'll tell you, and thank you for that question. Hopefully you all understood where she was going. Are we going to step into the legislative lane? No. Not directly. Right? Many of us, especially those of us who are not elected, um, we, are, we have to be influences by, influencers by, by virtue of our status in our respective systems. Um, I can tell you um, with pretty good certainty that if the judiciary were to begin to insert themselves directly and um, publicly into the state houses of this of this nation, there would be bills passed that would completely shut the judiciary down, irrespective of our separate um, but equal branches of government. And so directly, no, we, we won't wade into that. Now, are there opportunities for uh, legislative input and dialogue from time to time? Yes. But as this blueprint thing has evolved, it's next to impossible for us to develop a legislative uh, strategy for all 50 states and I believe six territories. It's practically impossible to do. And so the goal is that as we develop our strategies in, for impacting those things directly under the guise of the judicial branch, that legislative lead, leaders, remember I pointed out those uh, leaders, those li leading the lines of judicial society, that within their framework locally, they can begin to have those discussions with their state legislative leaders on their own. And a lot of times they don't want to do that until they have some solid evidence or, or solid benchmarks or something to go on when they go to their uh, state house leader, state senate leader. And the other thing, as you can probably imagine, and our elected officials in here would probably uh, 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 back me up on this, they oftentimes already have relationships with their with their friends over in the in the uh, legislature. And so they know when to push and when to ease up. And I'll, I'll give them that. I'll give them that they, they know when to push, when to ease up. But as a matter of practice, we will not directly be stepping into that lane because guess what? We don't want them stepping into ours. Right. And when they will the pen, right? <laughs> because you don't. I mean, that's just a practical. Remember, I'm a practical person. You don't want someone else because it, think about it. How many of us? Well, I don't even want to ask that question. Let me back up. Most of us, and I'm going out on a limb here, do not work in judicial systems where our elected judges and clerks I'll step over to the executive side a little bit and say prosecutors, but really our elected judges and clerks are rah-rah having media events all the time. That's not what they do. Now, our, our members of the state houses and the, and the state senates, they can do that because they got to get elected. Our judges may have to get elected, but oftentimes they run unopposed. Now, you know, or if you're in a House of Representatives or if you're in the state Senate, you know, you've got a constituency. You have to do things differently than what the judges do. Cool. Another question. I'm just curious, um, you know, when you mentioned like all the people who are involved, mm -hmm. you know, all 50 states, you know, represented uh, CCJ Costco. We know like in our nation, like, you know, you look in the representation, there's so much. I guess you can say, you know, political division, mm -hmm. being that there's all 50 states represented, is there any, like is everyone sort of on the same page? 
No. On this, okay. So, <laughs> so how does, again, you know, you hear about the gridlock in Washington mm-hmm. and can't get anything passed. Yeah. What does that look like in for the blueprint? This. Well, for the blueprint, is everyone on the same page? And back? No. Everyone's not. A, people come, come in with their uh, uh, perspectives, their ideologies, their biases. Uh, and, but we don't have gridlock. And we don't have gridlock because most, if not all, of the people who are involved have committed themselves to productive changes productive dialogue. See, if everybody's mad at each other, don't want to talk to each other, you're not going to get anywhere. I knew that when I took this job, right? I don't have a job to go back to. <laughs> this is it. this job, my, the job I was, would have been in is field. And so I have, I have uh, incentive to work with people of different stripes, different backgrounds. I don't, I don't care what their political affiliation is. You know, I joke all the time, and this is a joke. So people who are watching at home or um, from your desk at work, you know, I used to joke and say, uh, a New York Republican is a Georgia Democrat. I know that there's change because depending on where you are, I don't, you know, whatever letter or not that you have next to your name means something totally different depending on what state you're in. And that's real. And so there's no gridlock. It's slow change. But to be honest, some of what we've accomplished, there's going to be a deluge of things to come out by the end of this year. Some of what we've accomplished in not even a year and a half is remarkable. To the number of people who are committed, even people who were suspicious of participating. Very suspicious of participating in this because there are political realities at home. Political reality. Imagine, you, you know, you live in a particular community, you run for office, you hold that office, and people find out that you're involved with some people who appear to be doing some things that are distinctly different from what the local expectations are of you. That's a challenge. Imagine if you're a golf player and you're elected, and I'll get to you in a second, and you're elected, and they find you're working on this blueprint for racial justice mumbo jumbo. They're gonna kick you out the country club. Just because you're trying to have productive involvement. Because some people like it or not, they thought about their children and their children's children. The train is moving, and they've decided to get on board even if they have to take measured approaches to this change. Everybody's different. There are some people scream from the rafters. I mentioned that earlier. They can jump in head first and there are no consequences to them politically. There are others. If they are that vocal and public about what they're involved in, there are severe consequences and they will be booted from office. And then many of us in here who are not elected, if we work for somebody who is, or a bench of people, we'll find ourselves on the chopping block because you're going uh, publicly going against the grain in a fashion that's not acceptable locally. You have your own brain, but you move at the pace that's, that works for you. Let somebody else carry the water for you, as I say you still get the same result over time. Hey, I didn't have anything to do with that, but this is what just came down from the National Center, the Conference of Chief Justices. Hey, this is is where it is. We've got to follow it. It's best practice, right? You've probably been in some of those meetings, but put the blame on somebody else. So there's a way to do it. Thank you, you pass it to her there. Does the blueprint include a section on advocacy, allyship, and pipelines? And by that, I'm referencing, I've researched data and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but if you see the pie chart and you see white, um, Asian, Pacific Islander, Latino, black, and you see maybe white male, this many judges, Mm -hmm. and then it goes down to kneel, 
thereabouts. Okay. Um, does the blueprint consider allyship, advocacy, pipeline, that pipeline? So, you know, we we have a problem that's going on right now, but mm -hmm. that pipeline to the judiciary or even to being lawyers or court prof court professionals mm -hmm. in the future, um, you know, where we educate and speak to young people and say, hey, um, you're in this population of people and we don't really have that many folks who look like you mm -hmm. In the, in the judiciary. So now I want to be an ally. I want to be an advocate for you to think about that profession. Sure. Okay. And that way, you know, maybe 20 years from now, or 30 or 40 or 50, 20, 30, okay. we'll have some, some different people, different faces, different races, and even different um, physical capabilities sure. and abilities on the bench, in the bar, and in the courthouse. There is some, so uh, and it, it's like almost like the shared language guy, the verbiage, right? Directly, allyship, advocacy, we don't use those words necessarily, but the efforts are there and they're developing to ensure that there are pipeline and there are programs and there are opportunities for people to become linked into these roles over time. So as we look down the line, we begin to see more and more of people who may have generally, based on the color of their skin, not held these roles, have opportunity to hold these roles. So we don't we're not we don't say allyship or advocacy, but the efforts and the work is there. OK, hold on, let me get I need to, to pass that back. Excuse me. Thank you. OK, we'll get that next. Thanks, Ken. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I have a question. Well, I do have a question. I'm going to ask something of you. Sure. That is that <clears throat> as I was listening to you and looking at the uh, blueprint, <clears throat> excuse me, I was actually, I am excited and encouraged because um, as I look around the room, I don't see a lot of people in my age group, but... Um, <laughs> You're I young. Grew up, You're young. I grew up through a period where uh, <coughs> uh, initiatives like your blueprint worked. And I was rolling with you until you got to that point and said, what does the future hold? And you said, I don't know. Yeah. But then again, you actually do know because you continue to talk about change. And if you all keep doing this, it's going to create a change. And so the future does hold the opportunity for change. And, and so, uh, uh, as, as, as I want to roll with you and, 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 and really be encouraged by this, what encourages me more is that I know that if you continue to do this and continue to move down this road, that there will be change. Now, you might not know what's going to change or what's going to change That's first, yeah. but there will be change. So uh, I don't know. I'm not going to let you uh, put that roadblock on me. You're going to open no, up the no, roadblock. No. And, no roadblock. And you're going to say change. No roadblock. You're going to say change. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I believe there's a message in the chat. Um, let's see. You, you Hold on just a moment. I'll let it right. Here, here, here's your, if you don't mind. You want me to hold the microphone you speak? I'll be your assistant. <laughs> uh, Gina is asking, inclusion initiatives or planning to increase diversity is often reserved for human resources. There is a limited amount of ability to address these issues on a smaller scale with recruitment. Can you provide any suggestions or recommendations on how to gain access for making changes or working on these types of initiatives? Hmm. Interesting. You're right. Some things are housed in human resources. But I take, I don't want to say I take issue with it, but I don't see a lot of this work as human resource related specifically. Certainly, you need human resources uh, with respect to their expertise and recruitment and, and identifying talent. Um, but you're right. Many jurisdictions do not have in-house human resource personnel. 
the, the majority, let me, let me just cut the, the majority of court systems in this country don't have uh, human resource personnel. Um, and so suggestions that I have are to I work with organizations such as that have been identified, specifically the National Center for State Courts, identify best practices and see how within your jurisdiction locally, how you can utilize these best practices to capture and bring in the type of people that you're looking for. That's a, that's a, that's a, a bit difficult to answer because every single jurisdiction is different and I don't necessarily know uh, that particular person's jurisdiction. But look at best practices, they are there, and figure out with help, I'm offering myself and my organization, how do you recruit, identify and recruit the type of people that you're looking for? Because sometimes if people don't know you exist, no matter how good your efforts are, you won't get who you're hoping to get. If that makes sense, I hope. You won't get them if you don't know. All right. I can take one more question if anybody has one. On the chat. Okay, well, let's do the chat. Sarah's question is, how do we ease employees' concerns regarding the radical opinions coming out of SCOTUS? Is this initiative looking into this? No. <laughs> <laughs> radical is a person's point of view. Clearly, a majority of the Supreme Court of the United States of America did not feel as though their opinion was radical. Methodical, if you ever read full opinions, these are not knee-jerk reactions. Their writings are very, very full. And so, no, we're not. This, this is not an area that, that we're looking into. Um, we operate in a fluid environment in this country where both decisions made in the federal judiciary uh, have far-reaching consequences that ultimately touch us in our state judicial systems. But no, we're, we're to be frank, we're not looking into uh, decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court. And again, radical is in the eye of the beholder. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time that I have. I appreciate you. If you need me, shoot me an email, call me. I'm willing to talk to you at any time. If you want me to come to your jurisdiction, for some reason I do a lot of, this is a part of my job, right? I speak publicly, but there's a lot of it that's done behind closed doors due to the sensitive nature of the topic. If you need me, if you want my help, reach out to me, I'll do what I can. Thank you for your time.